I'd like to thank Wayne, because this started about two years ago, uh, where I had an opportunity to apply for a grant within the University of Florida to travel somewhere to uh, work on a worldwide, worldwide problem. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't work it out last year, but now we finally got there. So I'd like to thank Wayne for helping me with that process, but also the Gympie Council as well, because you know, they took me around yesterday to a lot of different places and uh, it was really interesting. And unfortunately, it looks very similar to what I see almost every day in Florida. Also want to recognize my student who's just sitting down, Jose. You can stand back up real quick. He's my PhD student that's working on uh, what I call smut grass, parabolus management. And so some of the stuff that I will talk about today is coming directly from his research as well. All right, so what I wanted to do was give you some brief background on Florida, kind of talk about our different management systems, uh, what type of production systems we have, and then focus on smut grass. That's what I call giant rat's tail grass or witty sporobolus grass or whatever you want to call it. I call it smut grass. So if you hear smut grass, just replace it in your brain with what you call the sporobolus species. I'm going to touch a little bit on biology. Uh, Wayne covered that quite a well. Uh, and then some competition studies that were done before I started at the University of Florida, and then some greenhouse research that we done while I was there as well, and then go into management. And you'll see why I'm bald once we get into the management strategy. Okay, so it's been kind of frustrating. And then talk about some of our current research that we're working on uh, right now. All right, so Florida is very diverse in agriculture, so we run the gamut from sugarcane, uh, dairy production, cattle and calves, strawberry, tomatoes, green peppers, squash, and then a huge floriculture landscape ornamental industry, which is consequently one of the ways we got a lot of our non-native species into our state. Okay, so that's just a side note. But calf production, about 9% of the state's uh, cash receipts come from our cow-calf industry in the state. So we have about 915,000 uh, cattle, 1.7 million total if we include the dairy industry. So <clears throat> that's kind of where it's at. And I have this line here because this kind of separates what we refer to as the subtropical, the tropical region of the state. And then you get up into the more temperate part of our state of Florida as well. Uh, the STAR, this is actually where I do most of my work. We have a research center of uh, about uh, 3,000 acres, and it's a working cattle ranch, and we work directly on that ranch to help uh, our producers in our state. And the bulk of the 915,000 beef calves are in this part of the state as well. So we're very well oriented in, within the state. All right, so important forages. Um, we talked about rose grass and pangola grass uh, quite a bit yesterday, and those were things that we did have at one time. Um, however, they just don't stay for one sort of a reason or another. And I think primarily is because cattle producers in the state got very used to bahia grass or paspalum, which you guys consider more of a weed here. But that is our base forage in, in the state of Florida. Um, it grows in about uh, 2 million hectares, and uh, they have tried to replace it with rose grass, pangola grass, but they like to overgraze things because bahia grass will take that overgrazing. It takes low fertility, it takes flooding, it takes drought, it takes everything somebody can throw at it. <clears throat> so our producers really like that because of that. Um, besides bahia grass, we also grow uh, Bermuda grass and also one that was brought in from Africa that we refer to often as limpo grass. And then star grass, another South African uh, forage. And sometimes in the southern part of the state, not so much, but more so in the northern part of the state, they will overseed in the winter months with annual ryegrass. And then legumes would be clovers in the north. Perennial peanut um, is another one that is starting to gain um, some attention, primarily up in this part of the state, but we do have some growers in the southern part of the state growing perennial peanut as well and then some other tropical uh, species like Ashenomany and sun hemp. Okay, important weed species. Well, obviously, you know, I wouldn't be here if smut grass wasn't one of our number one, 
uh, weed species, but also some natives like andropogons are quite troublesome. And then what you call blady grass, what we refer to as kogan grass, is probably our, our third, uh, or number two or number three. Sometimes I think um, the blady grass should be above smut grass because I'm much more scared of that taking over than I am um, the smut grass. Uh, broadleaf weeds, um, I haven't seen any of what I think is our number one broadleaf weed in the state of Florida here, but definitely uh, spiny amaranth and um, some side of species as well. And then brush, I've uh, seen a quite a bit of lantana, but we also have rubus species and uh, some other natives that become problematic. All right, so this is why we're here, right? So this is something that uh, I've worked on every year since I started my position in 2004 at the University of Florida. So this is something we're probably gonna to continue to work on and as we get into this a little bit later, you'll understand why. But this is a pretty common site in South Central Florida. You have a lot of smut grass and you'll see the short grass in between these tussocks and that's the desirable bahia grass. So very similar to what I've seen here for the most part you know, today. What species do we have? Well, uh, the first one, uh, this was the one that was first detected in the late 40s, early 50s, and it was Sporobolus indicus, introduced from tropical Asia. Um, they, th the one, the research that was done in the 70s on this, they found about 45,000 seeds per plant, and they thought seed remained viable for at least two years. So we're, I don't know where they got that data from. I think that was just a statement inside uh, that thesis. The next one that came along, and I have a timeline for this that I'll show you in a second, was giant smut grass. And there's arguments all over the taxonomy world about which species this actually is. And truth be known, I really don't care um, because the management is going to be the same. So <clears throat> it's either a subspecies of indicus or it's Jackie Montii. Whether it is or not, um, I don't know that it really matters as far as the management scheme goes. So <clears throat> this one has really become the dominant species. We don't know a lot of biological information about uh, this species per se, but we assume it produces as much as, if not more, seeds. And I think Wayne's data is showing that it potentially could uh, up towards of 80,000 seeds per plant. Okay, so. Our research center was uh, started in the early 1940s. So in the early, early 1950s, the small smut grass was first noticed as a serious weed. So they started some research back in then, in, in the 50s. Even though they were doing this research, the different trials that they were working on by the mid 70s, about 75% of improved pastures were infested in central Florida. In the 90s, a giant smut grass was first detected in South Florida. And basically we're seeing the same thing. A lot of different strategies out there to try to manage it. Um, and it seems like at some points is we don't, we're not getting anywhere. But it's, I believe it's all about management. And I think Damien has talked on that as well. All right, so seed characteristics. So Wayne touched on this, so I won't say a lot. About at least 45,000 seeds per, plot, or per plant, a one to 9% germination at maturity but you can scarify these seeds by either uh, mechanical scarification or animals eating them. You increase your uh, germination to 94 to 98%. And um, seed maturation on the panicle is a continuous process where you have flowering, immature, mature, and seed chatter all occurring at the same time on, on an inflorescence. Okay, so this is some research that was done in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, by Jeff Malahi at the research center. It's about two hours south of where I work. And basically this is showing that without herbicide treatment and low densities of smut grass, you produce about 11, 1200 kilograms per hectare of bahia grass. But once you start getting to medium, a 20 to 70% density or high greater than 70%, and this is ground cover, um, you reduce bahia grass production by 32 and 71 percent respectively as you increase that density. So that, that's kind of disturbing, but if you go back and look at pictures of this plant and with, since animals tend to not graze it as they mature, you end up with shading, which reduces the amount of growth of your desirable forage. 
Okay, so <clears throat> another thing that we realized from this work too is as these seedlings become established, the, the smut grass seedlings become established at low densities and it's sitting there and it's kind of competing with our desirable forage, it really has a tough time. If you look at these blue bars on the left, it really has a tough time increasing its biomass over the growing season. But you get more seeds, you get more seed production, you get more plants being produced in, in that pasture. And so they start competing more with your desirable forage. And by the time you get to medium density in these orange bars here, you start to see kind of a linear increase over time in biomass. Then as you produce more seed, you get more um, smut grass plants in that pasture, you almost end up with exponential growth throughout the growing season as your density becomes higher. So it's kind of scary. You add more plants, you end up with a lot more biomass, you end up with a, a less productive pasture. <clears throat> All right, so one thing I failed to mention that I wanted to in the beginning when I was talking about Bahia grass, our desirable pH is about five and a half for optimum Bahia grass growth. Our native soil pH is about four and a half. You get above six, six and a half, Bahia grass really doesn't like that either. So it really likes that pH value of about five and a half. So we started to look at uh, different soil pH values under greenhouse conditions on how giant smut grass and Bahia grass competed. And so this is just a fancy diagram that we use to basically determine whether Bahia grass or the smut grass was more competitive over time. So I'm not going to bore you with the details in that and we'll summarize it in this table. <clears throat> a little bit easier. So we had two densities, uh, four plants per pot or eight plants per pot, and we had three plants of Bahia grass to one plant of smut grass or two to two or one plant of Bahia grass to three plants of smut grass here. And eight plants per plot, we just doubled our, our population, okay? pH four and a half, five and a half, and six and a half. If we had more Bahia grass than smut grass, Bahia grass it would definitely outcompete that giant smut grass. That kind of, seems, kind of seems like a no brainer, right? Um, as we get to a one to one ratio, giant smut grass would outcompete the Bahia grass at pH levels of four and a half and five and a half. But if we increased our pH to six and a half, which really surprised me, the Bahia grass would start, start outcompeting the giant smut grass. But when you have more giant smut grass than Bahia grass, obviously it's going to outcompete that. Now, you start increasing densities. The only time Bahia grass outcompeted giant smut grass was at pH level four and a half. Okay, so as I've thought about this over the years, because we did this uh, four or five years ago now, um, and looking at our roadsides in Florida, which are inund inundated by giant smut grass, the difference is our road sides tend to be pH levels upwards of eight. And Bahia grass will not survive, the smut grass still will. So then we end up with more of a problem on our road side. So it's not that the giant smut grass will not um, grow at these higher pH levels, but Bahia grass won't. And then this is just some data showing the biomass of the Bahia grass versus smut grass at the different pH levels. So pretty even at pH four and a half, pH five and a half, the giant smut grass just takes over. And again, at the same, you double your density, same trend, four and a half, they kind of hold e even on biomass, but you start increasing the pH, the smut grass starts to take over. All right, so <clears throat> kind of talked about the biology, the competition, and now we're going to move on to management. And this is some work that was done in the 1950s. So I'm showing work from a very, very long time ago, but I think the similarities that we, we saw yesterday to this is, is pretty evident. So this was a mowing frequency. It was mowed <clears throat> either weekly bi-weekly, three weekly, or every three weeks or every four weeks over the growing season. And you can see where it was mowed weekly. We saw about a 35% reduction in the number of plants in those plots. Okay, 
Where we started decreasing mowing frequency, it didn't really seem to matter all that much. We did see a slight decline, somewhere between eight and about 12% reduction in the number of plants. But what we do do, we might not do a lot in decreasing our density, um, but what we do do is we decrease the basal width of those clumps. So those clumps get smaller, makes, tends to make those clumps a little bit more palatable. So you might see a little bit more grazing um, from those situations. So this was in 1955. They repeated this in 1956. So they said, yeah, we create smaller plants. They're just as vigorous. They produce uh, seeds. Little possibility we're going to eradicate smut grass by mowing. I, again, I think that's a no-brainer as we look at this, but it does make it more palatable. So it does increase the grazing area within a given paddock. So then later studies are suggesting that mowing enhances seed spread, and I, I think that's pretty obvious, you know, listening to Wayne this morning, uh, that just how these seeds are produced <clears throat> and within 16 days, right? What about grazing management? Um, this is something that they've looked at a lot in the 1970s near the main campus in Gainesville, and basically said that all results Grazing pressure had more impact on smut grass density and biomass than rotation frequency, which is really surprising to me. And then all studies that indicated that cattle lost weight and body condition was low. Okay, so that was indicating that not a very good forage, not worth anything <clears throat> whatsoever. Late 90s, and this goes back to some of that work I've already talked about, um, they actually found that smut grass ground cover increased under continuous grazing, so different than the small smut grass variety in the 1970s, <clears throat> but rather it decreased under rotational grazing and our desirable forage ground cover increased. So that was something we were after at that point. And cattle increased weight and body condition increased from five to six. So we're actually seeing a positive result, but the difference I believe between the 70s and the 90s in the 70s, they did nothing to the, grass, the smut grass prior to the grazing events. In the 90s, they burned and mowed prior to grazing events. So they had grass that was more palatable, which makes sense that they were able to actually see some um, gain in those. <clears throat> All right, so this is part of actually Jose's work, uh, just kind of following up on that. And there's more to this story that I'll show with, share with you in a little bit why we actually did this. So we took a pasture um, late winter, early spring, burned it off, let it come back and let cattle come in and graze. So we're able to actually track how much the cattle were using the smut grass that had been grazed and be able to compare it to uh, pastures that had not been grazed. <clears throat> And I included these pictures to really show the difference in utilization. And it's pretty obvious that the cattle have been grazing this and they're grazing the bahia grass in between all of these clumps. And everybody see that okay? <clears throat> and we've known this for a while. This is from the work in Immokalee uh, several years ago. If you've burned it or mowed it, uh, the smut grass, the digestibility, and crude protein is just the, as good as bahia grass. So we're finding the same thing with uh, Jose's studies as well. All right, so what really happened when we burned uh, <clears throat> smut grass and grazed this? We did this in two different locations, and basically we found a 55% reduction or 44% reduction in smut grass dry matter because the cattle were utilizing it. Okay, so we're, we're seeing a definite benefit with that regard. So again, uh, just to show a different shot, um, grazed smut grass versus ungrazed smut grass. And in this study, we had a one week grazing period, three week, three week, three week resting period. And another benefit that we observed, but we didn't measure this, um, but we did observe that after a grazing event, all the seed heads were, were gone or not produced, but they were produced inside our exclusion cages where the cattle were not allowed to graze. 
could be that we're actually spreading it that way after seeing some of your data, Wayne, and that's something that we probably need to look at to have a better understanding. All right, so <clears throat> what about ground cover reduction? Through burning and grazing intensity, do we see an effect of ground cover reduction? And simple answer is, in a situation where the manager fertilizes every year, not so much, but in a situation where we see um, low fertility, overgrazed, you know, everything that somebody could do wrong, like we did here, you see a, a slight difference in the ground cover reduction, but not anything to really write home about. You know, it's not going to be that slam dunk. You know, we're going to get rid of it by grazing, by burning and grazing. Okay. Chemically speaking, um, we've had two herbicides in, in the states uh, that we've used. Uh, Dalapon was one of them. It's no longer available. It required high application rates, retreatment, um, mowing or chopping after application, uh, increased control with low application rates, and, and then fertiliz fertilization helped a decrease by increasing our competition, which has already been mentioned today. The problem was the grazing restriction was greater in 60 days and injury to our desirable forage was substantial. However, the funny story behind this is this has gone away. We have a different one. The one that I'm gonna talk about next is probably better, um, less injury in our bahia grass, but all my producers want this herbicide back because they felt it worked but they don't remember the amount of injury they had. So anyway, <clears throat> this is our current herbicide that we use. It's called Velpar or, or, or hexazinone. Use rate, um, three and a half liters minimum. We typically recommend 4.7 liters uh, for giant smut grass, but both of them probably the same amount. We need this applied during the summer rainy season to get it into the soil. And I'm going to focus more on that a little bit later. But what's the problem? I think this is the same problem that you encounter here. We control the smut grass. We have a bare spot. as a place for another weed to come in. Or you get more smut grass to germinate in that same spot. So you trade one weed for another. Cost is about $67 per hectare, so this is by and far our most expensive pasture herbicide in the U.S. And it did used to have a grazing restriction, but that was removed about four years ago. All right, so <clears throat> rate titration, just a fancy word is we increased our rates and tried to figure out where we got about 90% control of giant smut grass using um, hexazinone, and basically it's somewhere around that one kilogram per hectare rate, which was about 4.7 liters per hectare, somewhere in that ballpark area. Same could have been said for small smut grass, it was about the same amount. <clears throat> and this was the table I showed earlier where we had a 30 or 70% reduction in bahia grass production as we increased our smut grass densities from 20 to 70 to 70%. We add the Velpar, and yes, we do see some injury, um, some reduction in our bahia grass biomass, but we definitely see um, <clears throat> less and better production um, where we had high densities of smut grass by applying the Velpar to remove that competition. So we're starting to see a rebound of that bahia grass by applying the Velpar. All right, so we see this level of injury, and this was within the same season of application. If we go out a year after and look at this data, where we have bahia grass without any Velpar treatment, upwards of 2,000 uh, kilograms, compare that to with bahia grass with a Velpar treatment the previous year, we actually do see an uptick in production. <clears throat> giant smut grass, obviously untreated. Same thing we showed earlier. You have more biomass as you increase density, but you add the Velpar to the system and we decrease our smut grass uh, biomass significantly. 
So this was another study just to reiterate the tolerance uh, between uh, Bahia grass and Velpar. We increased our rates from zero to 2.24 kilograms per hectare. So this, the 1.12 is our standard application rate. And over a 12 week period, if I can follow my colors, uh, uh, although you do see this line is below our untreated, that's in the blue, it's really not statistically significant. So we did have a lot of variation in our response. So overall, we felt this was pretty safe, but you have to take into account that our soils in Florida are sandy. So we get a lot of uh, downward leaching, not lateral movement, a lot of times of this herbicide. All right, so we realized then um, back in 2006, seven, after we completed some of that work that we're not gonna get it just by um, <clears throat> herbicide alone, but I wanted to look at a multi-year approach because a lot of times what happened is people would go out and spray one year and they'd wait three or four years and spray again. And, but by three and four years after that, they're already to a point where the density is just as much, if not greater than where they started three years previous. So I started to look at a multi-year approach. Um, we went out into pastures in 2008 and figured out we had about three plants per square meter. After we recorded those data, we applied Velpar at uh, the 4.7 liters per hectare, or we applied glyphosate at 9.4 liters per hectare. So we're looking at total renovation. We sprayed uh, these plots here, and then about a month after we sprayed the glyphosate, we went in and started tillage and we tilled for about two months and then reseeded with Bahia grass and then followed that throughout the next year. And then our last treatment was a fall roller chopping. And if you don't know what that is, I'm gonna show you a picture of that uh, momentarily. So then we put on these treatments in 2008. We came back in 2009 and recorded our densities and what I'd expect from the Velpar is to see a significant decline in smut grass density. However, I wasn't expecting to double my population of smut grass. Yeah. Go research, right? So we found something as like, well, that's kind of disturbing. But then what was kind of neat was this last one. I had no idea that a fall roller chopping treatment would decrease our density by as much as a herbicide application. And I believe what happened in this case, and I've not been able to repeat this one, um, we were so dry during that winter, we did that roller chopping event, <clears throat> and those tussocks, the smut grass tussocks, the roots were exposed, they dried them out, those plants died. Bahia grass tolerates drought very well. So when we finally did get in some springtime rain, the Bahia grass recovered, the smut grass did not. So that was kind of a unique situation. Like I said, I have not been able to repeat that again. All right, so after we recorded these numbers in 2009, we put on another treatment of Velpar across all three initial treatments, 2.3 liters per hectare. So basically a half rate. And it looked outstanding. Uh, very satisfied, uh, we did see a further decline uh, with two sequential Velpar applications applied year apart. Uh, even though we doubled our smut grass population by complete renovation, we were able to knock most of those plants out. And then we further declined uh, those, the smut grass from our fall roller chopping treatment. Unfortunately, we didn't go past 2011 in these studies, but basically I think uh, the trend was where we applied two years of herbicide, we tend to have less smut grass than when we disturb the soil. So we're starting to see a, a slight uptick in the number of plants where we did disturb the soil in those plots. All right, so this uh, kind of got me excited a little bit and we started looking at this a little bit more closely. Ah, there's my fall roller chopper, I forgot. So that's what a, a roller chopper looks like if you've never seen one. So this was the next experiment where we're looking at sequential annual applications. 
These were on six meter by six meter plots. And I'll walk you through this because this is kind of confusing. So in 2008, we went with Velpar at either 0, 2.3, 3.5, or 4.7 liters per hectare. And then in 2009, we came over those plots with 0, 2.3, or 3.5 uh, liters per hectare. And we're looking at the smut grass number of plants per plot. And that's the total number of plants in a 6 by 6 meter plot at 24 and 36 months after treatment. So you see where we do nothing, we start out with about 12 plants per plot, and they just increase over time, as you would expect. If you do something um, <clears throat> in the second year, it just doesn't seem to be enough, uh, these lower rates. You do see a little bit of a downtick the first year after, or the two years after application, but they skyrocket right back, like I talked about earlier. Now, this one here and this one here, uh, this is the same equivalent rates. So this was applied over one season versus two seasons. And you end up with the same results at 24 months after treatment. Unfortunately, you also same, end up with the same results at three years after treatment, um, where they just skyrocketed back. But where we increased our rates from 2.3 to 3.5, or, or 3.5 followed by 2.3, we tend to hold the, those populations back a little bit better. So I feel like we need a little bit more herbicide in that situation um, for those sequential applications to really keep them at bay. Uh, so I'm trying to get producers to say, don't just go out one year and hope for the best. It took you three to five years to get where you're at today. So don't expect a single herbicide application to make it go away. So we're really looking at these multi-year approaches now. All right, so I wanted to go back to this. We talked about this already a little bit, the burning followed by grazing. And our original intention in this study was to burn it and compare burn versus non-burn pastures and rotational grazing to see if we can decrease the root reserves in the smut grass so we could spray it with Velpar during the rainy season and then end up at reduced rates and end up with better control. Well, this is another reason why I'm bald. Ever since I did those sequential applications back in 2012 and 13, I haven't been able to get those to repeat very well because of the amount of rainfall. So basically we found that we had no effect on smut grass control with, with exazinode followed by rotational grazing, regardless of rate. But we feel that excessive rainfall is basically the reason we're seeing such bad control uh, with the Velpar. So this is the next part we're going to talk about as part of Jose's work as well. Uh, we used the 4.7 liters per hectare in the greenhouse. Uh, smut grass was uh, transplanted into four liter pots <clears throat> and with uh, field soil. We let these plants grow in the greenhouse for several months and then sprayed 4.7 liters per hectare over the top, let that dry for about four hours. Then we simulated rainfall from anywhere from no rainfall up the way to 20 centimeters of rainfall. All right, so basically found out somewhere between a half of a centimeter to somewhere below five centimeters was going to be our window under these conditions to end up with optimum control with Velpar. So this was kind of confirming what we had been thinking in the field that we needed rainfall to get the Velpar into the soil for uptake by the plants. But if we get too much rainfall, it's not going to work either. So this is kind of confirming that. We also did this in the field. So uh, Jose painstakingly went out every week and sprayed beginning in April as we get in end our dry season and start our rainy season. And um, <clears throat> every Friday he would go out and spray. We'd collect rainfall in the field for those seven days after application. And uh, this is what we have come up with from our 2016 data. And basically what we have in the bars is percent control. The, the orange line is the amount of rainfall we had seven days after application. So for April 22nd, we had 
uh, just under two centimeters of rainfall. And <clears throat> we ended up with about 65% control. Not really where we wanna be, uh, but better than no rain, followed by 20% control the week after that. So no rain versus we had over close to 13 centimeters of rainfall on June 3rd. Again, 50% control. If you go back and look at these plots that are 50% control the next year, it'll look like you hadn't sprayed them. So that, that's how much quickly, that's how quickly they rebound. Okay, so basically what we come up with uh, from this work is somewhere between a centimeter and just under eight centimeters is probably our optimum window for the amount of rainfall. If you get below that or above that, then our herbicide tends not to work very well. All right, so this is, this is what it looks like when it does work. Um, and a lot of times that's what it looks like when it doesn't, unfortunately. All right, so for my management programs, I think two-year two programs are better than one year. You can't just spray it once and walk away. And I think that's what we're seeing here as well. You can't just spray it once and hope for the best. It's something that you just need to continue to stay after. Uh, renovation, um, our work has shown that if the pasture is 70% or more infested, it should be renovated, but it must be followed by a herbicide treatment within a year after planting, or that population is just going to get worse very quickly. Um, we feel like rotational grazing should help with control, but we haven't really been able to confirm this because of the rainfall that we received in the field. And rainfall is necessary to get it into the soil, but too much is bad also. All right, so Joe touched on this earlier, uh, using a wiper. In general, uh, this is a roto wiper that was produced in the US. Like Joe said, there's several different types. Um, <clears throat> usually most of our weeds, we can use a 10% solution of glyphosate and, and do very well. And as Joe said, wiping in two directions, it, we believe is a must. Uh, Jose has a study out in the field right now where we compared mode versus non-mode and then wiped in one direction versus two directions. And we're still collecting that data right now. The biggest thing that I hear my producers complain about is they go out and use it once and they said, well, damn it, it didn't work. So they go and park it underneath the shed. So you have a $3,000 piece of equipment that they're not gonna use again because they used it once and it didn't work. So I tell them, it's like, go back and get it out and go practice because it really is an art form, I believe. It's kind of something that's a little bit difficult because you don't, you can't tell how wet that roller is until you go out and touch it, right? How can you touch it when you're on a tractor? So one of the things that some producers in the northern part of our state, they've actually been adding a foam marker solution to get this roller kind of foamy. So you can actually see how much is on that roller. So I thought that was pretty unique. It seems like I get more answers from my producers than they get from me lately, but that's the way we, it's going. So this is a little paddock at our research center um, that we did wipe with a 10% solution and looked very good. Um, we actually put our animals in, let them overgraze the bahia grass and then uh, applied the glyphosate with the roto wiper and I need to include my other picture in this because this was about a month after application. You went back to looked at this pasture in the next growing season, it looked like we hadn't wiped it. So yeah, we turned the top growth brown, but we didn't have enough herbicide to get down to the root system. Okay, so that's something that we continue to, to work on. Um, Jose's work, we're looking at, looking at different concentrations, trying to figure out where we actually need to be for smut grass. All right, so a question about biological control earlier. So I'm gonna tell you the story on this. Um, maybe it won't get me in trouble. So I was driving around with a ranch manager in South Florida and he's pointing to the smut grass clump. He goes, you see that clump over there? I said, yeah. He goes, it's dead. I said, yes, yes it is. He goes, I don't know what killed it. I said, okay. And I thought to myself, Somebody spot sprayed it and didn't tell you. Hello. <clears throat> so he keeps driving around and keeps pointing out smut grass clumps. 
Don't know why they're dead. All right, that's fine. So I've just let me out of the truck. I want to go home. They finally took me to this pasture. And it's about a 30 by 30 meter area that was smut grass clumps that were brown and dead. I said, okay, let me out of the truck. Went out and started looking at these places and the smut grass was covered with these little insects. And I don't know if you have these in Australia or not, but they are what we call chinch bugs. And they're normally a pest in turf and also are hay fields. So it's a, it's a blissous species of some sort. And we have no idea if it's a different subspecies at this point. Uh, every time they've tried to transport this to a lab, it hasn't survived to be able to identify it very well. Um, so that's something that we're continuing to look at and trying to understand. So these pictures were taken in 2016. We went back in 2017. They had um, 200 acre paddocks that were totally browned out by this chinch bug. So I have cattlemen that are very excited about this. They're trying to transport this all around the state. And I'm saying, no, stop, please stop. Because we don't know what this is going to do to any of our other desirable species as well. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do on this to see if there's anything possible at all. And then I think more bad news for our cattlemen is maybe a potential third species. I've sent this out to a couple different places and They've come back with two different names, so I've come to the point where I don't care what it is as long as we can control it <clears throat> with something. All right, so I'm almost done. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. Yeah, good, so this will work. So this is um, using the data that I've shown you earlier with the low, medium, and high densities. So this is some economic data where the stocking unit was 1.2 animals per hectare, weaning percentage rate was about 70%, the weaning weight was 250 kilograms, the calf price was $1.90 per kilogram, and the Velpar application costs around $67 per hectare. Pasture being continuously grazed, mature smut grass not grazed, and I think that's pretty common, uh, that the mature smut grass is not grazed unless there's nothing else out there. All right, so. We see brahea grass yield without any smut grass, about 2,700 kilograms per hectare. We do see a sharp decline as the smut grass does increase. So we see, say our brahea grass stand is reduced by 20%, 40%, or 30%, 33%, and almost uh, <clears throat> 40% as our smut grass density becomes higher. Our stocking rate factors, we just said if it's 80% behind grass stands, our stocking rate is 80% of <clears throat> our pastures without any smut grass whatsoever. So then that directly correlates to the amount of calf production and our calf value declines. Our cost of smut grass infestation increases because our calf value declines. Our smut grass control remains the same regardless so you see with a 20% or less uh, <clears throat> ground cover, there's really no economic return. You're actually losing money, okay, from an economic standpoint, all right? But if you have at least 20%, you're gaining 26 to $48 per hectare, or per stocking unit, which is per hectare. All right, so, this is all fine and dandy, right? So if you go out and prevent this from spreading, you're, you're losing money. Eh, whatever, I disagree. So <clears throat> do we really want to wait until our pastures are more than 20% infested? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think it's something you want to get um, ahead of as quickly as possible. So if you do spray, it takes three to five years to get back to the original density. So should we spread our economic analysis over more than one year? I do believe that. So that previous one we're looking at was only a single growing season. But I, I think what I really want to drive home is, you know, we work on this year in and year out, and we get frustrated very easily because it feels like we're getting nowhere. Um, but if we can get a jump on it early, and this goes with any weed species, 
if we can get a jump on it early and it seems like we're spending a ton of money and we're not seeing that, that immediate return, do nothing and see what happens. Because I guarantee it's going to be much worse later on. So I think if we get on it early and keep it from becoming, becoming dominant in the pasture, we're going to be much further ahead. All right, current research. Um, Jose has a lot of work because this is all his. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Additional rainfall studies. Um, we've, we've kind of finishing this one right here, the impact of fire grazing and hexazinone. We're looking at the, the rotowiper pretty heavily. We're actually impregnating dry fertilizer with hexazinone, and we've done that once. It looks fairly decent. We're going to continue to look at that because uh, we haven't seen this under high rainfall conditions at this point. So I want to see if we're going to end up with better control under high rainfall conditions versus just a typical broadcast recommendation. Um, tank, mixing, tank mixing residual herbicides. So hexazinone does have residual activity, but we get so much rainfall, it leaches out of our system so quickly. So are there other herbicides we can tank mix it, tank mix with it? We have several ranchers in the state that have 90 to 95% cover of smut grass and they're saying we can't afford to renovate everything. So we're going to try to use it. So they're mowing or burning and they're asking for ways to help slow down the regrowth so it'll stay palatable longer. So that's something we're looking at. And then I have producers using glyphosate as a selective treatment and this is kind of interesting. So we know Bahia grass, it takes about four times the amount um, it does for smut grass control. So they've looked at this, they are kind of happy with the level of control they get versus the damage they get in their Bahia grass. So I'm trying to really confirm how much damage they're getting because they really don't know. It regrows in the 30 days is their answer. So that's something we're also looking at. But I believe that is my last slide. Yeah, we'll leave on the smut grass. <clears throat> so I think we'll open up for questions if we have time.